Hey you, and welcome. My name's Mike, and in this old podcast for you folks, 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 fellow patriots, I have for you two, count them two separate stories for you. There, now these are two stories in one podcast. We're doing a twofer. Both of these are absolutely shit your pants terrifying. So, uh, look forward to that, I guess. And both of the stories in this podcast are about serial killers in the cities of Phoenix, Arizona, and Scottsdale, Arizona. Now, I'm kind of like giving you a twofer here on these ones, guys, because Scottsdale and Phoenix are like pretty much. I mean, come on, they're pretty much the same city. They're like right by each other. So let's not, you know, beat around the bush here. The first story I have for you revolves, revolved? I mean, it happened in the past, but I'm telling you to, you know, there was two, two serial killers active at the same time in the city of Phoenix during 2005 and 2006. If you can believe that two serial killers active in the same city at the same time, that's a hearty hell no from your boy over here. The second story I have for you today is set in Scottsdale, and it was a race against the clock for the police to find the killer. As a number of people, a whole heap of people who were involved in a court case started dying one by one by one. And the police needed to find this killer before he struck again. And although both of these stories, you know, they were separated from each other by over a decade, there was, in fact, one person who was involved in both, Dr. Stephen Pitt. He was helping out the police in the first story, in the second story, he was a victim. So before we get into this one, folks, if you enjoyed, and I really hope you do, what do I say? Your enjoyment is my priority. Please, you know, subscribe to the podcast, give me a nice little review, the whole five stars, anything at all really does, really does help out, folks. And now let's give it a go. It all started, it all began, it was birthed in the summer of 2005. That summer, it was long. It was hot. It was a hottie. It's all the good stuff right there. Although it's in Arizona, so I'm pretty sure all their summers are long and hot. But this one was like that, but more. And during that summer, over the months, there had been like strange signs, you know, kind of rumors whispered about some odd characters in town. Gunshots were heard. Police reports were filed. And there were some strange shooting deaths that largely remained unsolved. It was as if, you know, there was there was something in the air. Maybe it was the exposure. Maybe the hot Arizona sun was scrambling people's brains. Folk just fed up, you know, had enough of this. Or maybe something new had arrived in town and was making itself known. It was when Georgia Thompson's body was found that the police knew there was something more to what was going on than they had initially thought. Georgia was 19, an exotic dancer, and on September 9, 2005, her body was found in the car park of an apartment building. She had been shot in the head. Her pants had been unbuttoned, but she hadn't been sexually assaulted. And at the scene, the police found a bullet casing. Now, in the preceding months, there had been random shootings, and what started with dogs and cats and even horses being shot quickly spread to humans. The homeless mainly, the so-called less dead, called the less dead, along with sex workers, because police rarely investigate thoroughly when those murders occur. In addition to this, a number of sexual assaults were reported, and it was on the increase. In August 2005, one month before George's body was found, there had been a number of sexual assaults on teenagers near the Baseline Road in South Phoenix. That area had become a hotspot, and the perpetrator was still at large. The number of attacks in Phoenix would increase exponentially over the next two months. Four more in September alone, Three more in November, a mix of robberies, sexual assaults, and random murders on the streets of Phoenix. A man, Nathaniel Schaffner, was shot and killed on the side of the road trying to protect his dog. 
Sometimes the attacks would occur within minutes of each other. A shop being held up at gunpoint before the perpetrator ran out of his store and dragged a passing woman into his car to be sexually assaulted. It was anarchy and it was terrifying. In December, um, things didn't get any better, shockingly. On December 12th, Tina Washington was shot in the head as she walked home from a preschool where she worked. That same day, a man named Jose Ortiz was shot and killed walking the streets. Before 2006 rang in, there would be another robbery, shooting and murder in the city all linked together, but without any clear perpetrator. It was then the police began to theorize there wasn't one person behind all of this, there were two. See, in some instances, random people were shot at as they strolled down the road, and witnesses who survived the attacks were able to tell the police it was a light blue four-door car that the shots rang out from. In the other case, well, the cases were linked, as a number of sexual assaults had occurred along Baseline Road. There were of course other murders, but they hadn't been linked. Yet. In February 2006, two more bodies were found. Those of Romelia Vargas, 38, and Myrna Palma Roman, 24 years old. They were killed inside a food stall they both worked at, the Grill King, and both had been shot in the head. The next month, Chow George Chu, 23 years old, and Liliana Cabrera, 20 years old, were abducted from behind a restaurant they worked at. Chow was about to give Liliana a ride home when they met someone. Both were found shot to death. It had been Liliana's first day on the job. Now you might be a little confused at this point. So many attacks. Who's who? Who did what? And well, you weren't the only one. The city was confused, but more than anything, scared. A dark cloud was hanging over the city. The killing seemed to be intensifying. The killers were brazen. Not just going after lone, less dead, but sometimes abducting two people at a time, a man and a woman. The police knew there were two serial killers, at least two. And if it was two, well, they were working overtime. One killer was shooting from cars, doing drive-bys, the other assaulting women and shooting them and whoever they were with if they resisted. It continued. Two weeks after the restaurant employees, Chow and Liliana, were taken, a sex worker was found stuffed between a building and a shed. A month later, a woman was abducted by a man wearing a Halloween mask. The next day, another drive-by shooting, and 20-year-old Claudia Gutierrez Cruz was murdered. The police at this point came up with nicknames for the killers. You, you, you gotta have a nickname, otherwise are you a real serial killer? Are you though? The drive-by sniper was named the serial shooter. They didn't know the car make or model, they just knew it was a light-colored sedan. The other killer was called the Baseline Rapist, due to the early attacks being located along or near Baseline Road. The murders were eventually connected to the sexual assaults, and so then the Baseline Rapist became the Baseline Killer, and a sketch was circulated of this person who at this point, May 2006, they had 18 separate crimes linked to whoever this monster was. That number would later rise substantially as other past incidents were reviewed. But there would be one more victim of the baseline killer before he was caught. On June 29, 2006, at 9.30pm, the baseline killer struck for the final time. This time though, it would be captured on CCTV and shake Phoenix to its core. Not to be dramatic though, I suppose, um, I think you know with everything we've gone through, this warrants it. A woman named Carmen Miranda was cleaning her car at a car wash, while at the same time she was on the phone to her boyfriend. As she was speaking to him, she told him a panhandler was approaching her. She then screamed, and the phone it went dead. Hours later, her body was found in a building next door, her pants unbuttoned, 
and shot in the head. The CCTV, it's very hard to make out really anything other than two people struggling, one person forcing the other into the back seat of the car, and then the car door closes. Everywhere people were watching their back, watching every car that passed them on the street, never knowing if one of the serial killers could be right behind you. The baseline had started, well on and near baseline road, but it had spread across the city. Both killers were taken over. Two task forces were created to stop them. The serial shooter case had 375 people working on it, the baseline killer 100. Though after what happened to Carmen Miranda at the car wash, the baseline killer went underground. The serial shooter though, seeing well his um, time to shine, you know, can't have the baseline stealing the spotlight, ramped up. Eight more people were shot in July 2006, with the final murder taking place on July 30th. A young woman, Robin Blasnick, shot and killed while walking down the street talking on the phone. By this time, the baseline killer had murdered eight women and one man, and assaulted over 33 women. The serial shooter had killed at least eight and wounded 18. Talk about a year of fear. There were no leads, no suspects, nothing. But then, there was something. And a $100,000 reward will usually, uh, you know, loosen some lips and sink the serial shooter's ship. In a bar called the Stardust Tavern, Northwest Phoenix, a guy named Ron Horton had been told some things by a drunk friend. The drunk friend was named Sam Dedeman, and he told Ron he had been involved in the shootings. Bragging about it, having a grand old time telling this whole story, but then becoming remorseful. When the serial shooter's last victim was, well, serially shot, Ron, having, you know, kept this information to himself for a few weeks, and now he was feeling like he could have prevented it, he called the police. Though it also helped that the reward had just been offered. <laughs> what, what reward? Didn't even realize. Ron gave the police Sam's number. They traced it, and also surveilled a man Sam used to live with, one Jeff Hausner. Tailing them both, they happened to see Sam getting into a light-colored sedan. Maybe one of the survivors said bullets came from a light-colored sedan. The plates of that car led to one Dale Hausner, Jeff Hausner's brother. It turned out that Dale and Sam lived together. They were the serial shooter together. One drove, one shot. The police tailed them. Tell them even as they drove the streets of Phoenix looking for victims. They would slow down when people passed, as if, as if sizing them up, wondering if they should wind down the window or not, before suddenly pulling off. After being granted wiretaps and bugging their apartment, they heard them talking and laughing about the killings. It was on August 3rd they were both arrested. Dale Hausner never admitted anything, even though it seemed he was the brains, or, uh, hold that, what or lack of them, behind the operation. Sam Dedeman, he told the police about the whole shebang. They shot, they robbed, they set buildings on fire, slashed tires, all the while smoking meth. And it was all a game, a real life video game to them. They just wanted to wreck shit and smoke shit. They were, they were out of their minds the entire time. Some people just want to watch the world burn, or some shit like that. Dale worked as a janitor at the airport. And in his free time, he was a freelance photographer and also worked in the boxing scene in Phoenix. He even managed to get a picture with Mike Tyson once. He was a bit of a ladies man, though you wouldn't really think it to look at him. I mean, he looks like someone on meth. And he even tried to use the ladies as alibis for him when the shootings occurred. Couldn't have been me. I was off riding your one. That would fall apart. He had suffered tragedy though. In 1994, he was married with two kids in Texas. And one day while driving, his wife fell asleep at the wheel and the car went into a river. Both Dale's kids drowned. That is what turned him to drugs and, well, hating everything. 
Sam was nothing really, fuck all to his name. He had been an electrician, but due to drugs, he really couldn't hold down much, and he had a lengthy history. After the arrests on August 3rd, the police found scrapbooks in their apartment filled with news articles about the serial shooter, making, they were making a little scrapbook about their adventures. Also inside were articles about the baseline killer, and the police realized they were having a friendly little competition, you know, between serial killers, keeping, keeping track of each other. And speaking of the baseline killer, when the serial shooters were arrested, he hadn't struck in close to two months. But he did have gaps like that before, and it seemed it seemed only a matter of time before another victim turned up. They got in a forensic psychiatrist, a Stephen Pitt, to diagnose this guy and help create a profile. His modus operandi was, well, he started in August with the assaults before graduating to full-on murder. He would kill if they didn't comply. But if they did, he never, uh, if they did comply with him, uh, how do I word it? He never, um, finished. So DNA was actually kind of hard to find, but they did have it. Though no profile to match at that point. Also, none of the women he killed were assaulted, but they were usually posed with their pants down anyway. They had a few suspects, and in fact one false confession which wasted police time. And one of the suspects they had was a fella named Mark Gudo, a handsome mustachioed African American fella. He lived with his wife near where some attacks had occurred, and he had a history. As a teenager, he had been accused of sexual assault, but no charges were filed. And in 1989, he went to prison for sexually assaulting a woman, and then chasing witnesses with a shotgun. He later robbed a store at gunpoint, and for all this, he got 21 years. In prison, he married Wendy Carr, and he got out after 13 years in 2004. The next year, the baseline killer emerged. Mark, he lived a quiet life, he worked in construction, he would buy lunch for the guys, and he was, he was a well-liked, charming guy, which the police discovered when they put him under surveillance. They finally had a break when DNA came back from two teens that were assaulted back in September 2005 near Baseline Road. And it matched Mark Udo. He was arrested on the 6th of September 2006. That was his 42nd birthday. Happy birthday! At that point, he was only charged with the attack on the two teens as they didn't have more. But that was enough to keep him inside till they got it. They would, but it would surprise everyone who knew Mark, but maybe not everyone who knew his record. Neighbors would say he was a sweet guy. His wife, you know, she would say he was innocent. She even created a website for him, which ooh, hasn't been updated in six years, so maybe she got the picture. He's the baseline killer. He's a convicted felon. He's a serial <laughs> killer. Who's the Mark Godot you know? Uh, he's the baseline killer scapegoat. He is the person that was just black enough to be arrested. He's too old. He's too big. The police searched his home and found jewelry from his victims, along with traces of blood. This wasn't enough to outright call him the baseline killer, but that would come in time. That would be right about when they were able to attribute the murder of Sofia Nunez to Mark. Sofia Nunez was the only victim of his killed in her own home, her son walking in after school and finding his mother in the bathtub with a bullet to the head. She wasn't initially thought of as a baseline victim, but Mark was linked to it by witnesses at the scene after his initial arrest. Mark Gudeau was then charged with 74 crimes. He would plead not guilty. Mark would have two trials. The first was for the attack on the two teens. In September 2007, he was found guilty, and he got... Hmm... Uh, sorry, let me see here. Uh, 438 years in prison. And he still had another trial ahead of him for the other 74 charges laid against him. That would go ahead four years later. But in the meantime, the serial shooter trials 
began. Sam Dederman, he pled guilty to everything, and he got life without parole. Dale Boy, he was convicted of 80 of the 87 charges that were laid against him. He must have, whew, thank God I didn't get those final seven. He tried to uh, kill himself before the state could. That's weird, he was so good at killing other people. Jeff Hausner, Dale's brother, was also charged with participating in some of the serial shooters shooting. He got a few decades for that. Dale Hausner was sentenced to death. Um, six times he was sentenced to death, actually. Just, you know, in case he survives the first five. You know, six times a charm. Mark Gudeau's trial for, um, again, let me just uh, check notes. 74 crimes went ahead in 2011. They had his DNA. They had trophies from his victims. They had Tina Washington's ring found in his home. And a bullet from her scene was the same as bullets found at all the others. He was found guilty of 67 of those 74 crimes, including nine murders. He asked the jury not to kill him. They just weren't having it. And they killed him nine times. In 2013, Dale Hausner was found dead in his cell. He'd overdosed on antidepressants. So I guess, I mean, he, he got there in the end. His final victim was himself. Sam and Jeff are still in prison serving their sentences, as is Mark, who still to this day denies being the baseline killer. His sentences were reaffirmed in 2016. And that, my friends, my dear beloved friends, is the story of the baseline killer and the serial shooter, and how for, for one year, Phoenix, Arizona was on edge with not one, but two serial killers prowling the streets. That, jeez, Janie Mac, that is the stuff nightmares are, are truly made of. Um, but in the end, you know, hey, woo! Thankfully, they were caught, and Phoenix and the surrounding areas have been safe ever since. Oh wait, shit, no, I have another story to tell you. The year, it is 2018, almost 12 years after the rampages of the baseline killer and the serial shooter, those dickheads. In a small hotel room at the Scottsdale Extended Stay on 10 660 North 69th Street, a man was in that quiet, dusty motel room, the curtains shut against the soft evening light. Inside, a man wrote down four names on a small scrap of paper. In that darkened, dusty, musty room, the names Pitt, Feldman, Colby and Selmy were scrawled onto the front of an attorney's envelope. Those four people, they were linked together even if they didn't know it themselves. And the person who angrily scrawled their names had decided that they were the kind worth killing. On Thursday, May 31st, 2018, a hot day, as Stephen Pitt left his office, it would have been, you know, around 35 degrees Celsius, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, he stepped out of his building onto the curb. Stephen Pitt was a forensic psychologist that had, had made headlines. He had worked on cases like Joan Benet Ramsey, Columbine, and he had helped identify Mark Goudeau as the baseline killer, 11 years previous, as he struck just, just 30 minutes away, and sometimes much closer. Even though he worked on these high-profile cases, the majority of his day-to-day -day was focused on less sensational cases, you know, custody, divorce cases, and other criminal cases. And it was as he walked out of his building onto a busy street at 5.30pm on that 31st of May, he was gunned down. Shots rang out without warning. Witnesses who happened to be in the area at the time said the attacker, the shooter, was a, quote, round man with bags under his eyes and wearing a black cap. They said they overheard Stephen and this guy arguing before gunshots rang out and Stephen Pitt was shot to death and the attacker fled the scene. One witness who saw the shooter doing a legger 
said he was a white man. His description was sketched, and it was circulated. It would be less than 24 hours before this mysterious person would strike again. On Friday, the 1st of June, 48-year-old Valeria Sharp stepped out of the small law office she worked at, Bert, Feldman, and Grenier, around 2.15pm, lunchtime, so maybe she was, you know, about to head out for a bit of grub, if it was any other day. What's going on? A lady's down on the ground. She's she, she passed out on the ground. Stay on the phone. I'm going to transfer us over to paramedics. Okay, just a moment. It wasn't, and she was shot. She was shot in the face, and she managed to stumble towards a bus nearby, calling for help, before collapsing on the ground right beside her office. When the emergency services arrived, Valeria was already gone. But there was a trail of blood leading back to her office, and following it inside, there was another woman just crumpled inside the door. That was another paralegal named Laura Anderson. She had been shot twice. It seemed like she had tried to flee from the attacker. And I see the lady on the ground, the victim on the ground, face down, blood all over. And I thought that she landed on her nose and busted her nose kind of thing. Yeah. That's all I saw. But as I, w- as I was witnessing it, she was trembling. Like- so, a shooting at a law firm. Well, there's, there's no reason, uh, there's no shortage of reasons for that, I'll say. It's kind of, I guess it's kind of part of the job to piss people off and screw them over. So, at the start, the police had no indication of where to begin and why this had happened. It may not have even been linked to the profession of law, lawyering, etc, etc. It could have been related to the private lives of either Valeria Sharp or Laura Anderson. And this time, no one got a goo at the shooter who had marched into an office and opened fire. Kind of, uh, just, you know, shooting the shit, no pun intended. One of the investigators asked the attorneys and partners at the firm, Bert, Feldman, and Grenier, you know, we actually were just investigating a similar shooting just the day before. You guys ever use Stephen Pitt, psychiatrist, on any case by any chance? Any links, you know, between what happened yesterday and this? The answer to that was, um, yes. Yes, they had. But they had used him a few times on various cases. So although that's a lead, it would take a while before that lead became solid. Uh, solid. About seven hours after the shooting at the offices of Bert, Feldman, and Grenier, a real connection was made when the shell casings confirmed that the same person had shot Stephen Pitt, Valeria Sharp, and Laura Anderson. Well, the same gun shot them. Then, that very same day, Friday the 1st of June, maybe only a few hours after Valeria and Laura were shot, a man walked into an office building less than seven miles away. He was looking for a woman who had a private office there. She wasn't in at the time, so what did this guy do instead? What he did was shoot a man who was there. He shot 72-year-old psychologist Marshall Levine twice in the face. Marshall's body wouldn't be discovered until close to midnight that night, when his fiancée, worried he hadn't come home from work, found him dead in his office. Medic. Got some help on the way. Can you see him? Yes, he's in his office. He's hunched over on the on the sofa, um, and there's a bullet casing on the on the uh, okay, do you on see the blood anywhere. Do you see blood? Yes. And shades of what had happened 12 years earlier were beginning to emerge. What you know, at the time, appeared to be random attacks occurring without warning, with frightening suddenness, before the mysterious shooter disappeared once again into the city. Get the guy who shot those two shootings, and they get the person who did it? We are still working on everything right now. Oh, really? And we're still kind of hectic. Marshall's murder was quickly tied to the others, and word began to spread that they must be linked somehow. Related to the other, I am. I was going to say... Or it's related to the other homicides that are going on. Really two there. holes in the couch. Yeah. Yeah. So either he got nervous and missed, or he was killed. Look for bullet holes in the walls as well, guys. See if you can check behind that couch without moving the couch. A well-known forensic psychiatrist 
two paralegals and a psychologist. So who could be next? Well, judges were given extra security by law enforcement, as it appeared. Well, someone wasn't happy with how things went in a courtroom. It was certainly a series of targeted attacks. Hundreds of tips began pouring in, and it was on Saturday night, the 2nd of June, that, well, there would be a breakthrough. See, the police were correct in thinking the murders were linked to a court case, and maybe someone knew exactly which case it was. Connie Jones sure did. Connie Jones was married to a retired Phoenix police detective, and she had one son from a previous marriage who was in college. She knew who the killer was from that previous marriage. She called the detectives telling them that the three places that were targeted, but only one of the persons, were all involved in her divorce case from her first husband. Her first husband was a guy named Dwight Jones. Dwight Jones, by the way, he was not white, so the first witness got it way wrong. Connie and Dwight started a relationship when she was just 18 years old. Connie would go to medical school and become a radiologist. Dwight, he would join the army, and they would marry in 1988. Shortly after, Dwight dropped out of the army, and it wasn't long before Dwight began showing signs of depression and signs of violence towards her. He wouldn't be able to hold a job for long, and over the years, there were incidents of domestic assault. They kept at it for a few years, they'd have a son together and stuck through it, you know, for him, but the stake through the heart of their relationship came in 2009. Their young son was playing in a basketball game, and after, back at home, he obviously hadn't played well enough for his old man as Dwight began to shout at him. Connie, she basically told him to stop it when Dwight pinned her up against the wall, gave her a wallop, and said he would drown her in the pool. Connie was able to document this. She did not think he was joking about drowning her. She ran out of the house and called the police, which resulted in a standoff with SWAT. Dwight finally coming out with his young son in front of him, holding him like a human shield. Great stuff, what an awesome dad. What a fucking asshole. Less than a week later, Connie filed for divorce. Dwight was involuntary committed to a mental health institute, but he was let go after it was found he was, quote, not mentally abnormal. Stephen Pitt, the psychiatrist, then entered the picture to assess Dwight. He determined that he had anxiety and mood disorders, was narcissistic, antisocial, and paranoid. And Stephen Pitt himself told the court that without proper treatment, Dwight would, he would continue, he would continue to unravel. And he was dead right. Way too right. That, you know, him coming forward and saying that would later make him a target of Dwight's. Connie would get sole custody of their son, with Dwight getting supervised time with him, something he was not happy about. Connie would also have to pay Dwight $6,000 a month in spousal maintenance. She was a doctor, Dwight was jack shit. The two paralegals killed. Well, they worked at the law office Connie's divorce attorney worked at. Valeria Sharp and Laura Anderson weren't on his shit list. They were just there. Same for Marshall Levine, actually. He simply worked in the same building Connie and Dwight's son saw another psychologist at. She wasn't there that day. Well, she had been, actually. She had just left early. But Marshall was still there, and he ended up being killed. Connie, her husband, and son had just returned from a vacation when they saw the news, and she saw the signs as to who the killer was. And they quickly left town. It was likely he may turn up at her door. Connie knew who would likely be next, Paulette Selmy, the person who made the call that Dwight get supervised visits. But in the meantime, why he would do this was a mystery, especially so long after the divorce, and she was paying him a lot of money every month. What, um, what caused him to snap? Well, one indication could be from his YouTube channel called Exposing Lowlifes. 
It's been removed from the internet, but some clips still remain. He never mentions his name or shows his face. Instead, he shows this friggin' creepy white mask. He somehow came to the conclusion that there was some kind of conspiracy against him, that Stephen Pitt, Connie Jones, and all the others had abused his son and were trying to gaslight him and make him look insane, though I think, you know, after watching some of these clips, he was doing a good enough job of that on his own. Hello, YouTube, and welcome to my channel. You rule I have a psychiatric problem based on some piece of sh that she hired? People who enable sexual assault should be held accountable. They should go to jail just like the pedophile, just like the rapist. That's how Larry Nasser, Nasser, doctor, Larry Nasser got away with it for so long. And this new guy at UNC, can't think of that doctor's name, that's how he got away with it so long. That's how Bill Cosby got away with it. All of these people had money and titles, and they had people covering up their crimes, just like Connie. How many people does she have to grow? How many children does she have to molest? before she's brought to justice. His main thesis, though, was that he'd been robbed one son, and he'd kill those responsible. All the videos were posted within three weeks of the beginning of his rampage. So, they knew who was responsible for the attacks, and they even flew a helicopter in the middle of the night to Connie and her son to do a DNA test and confirm with trace DNA they had found on a bullet, you know, to confirm it was Dwight from his son's DNA but they didn't have Dwight himself, and he wasn't done just yet. Cell phone data would later show that on Sunday morning, shortly before the police began to track Dwight, he had driven to an upscale neighborhood in Scottsdale, Fountain Hills. Inside a house there, police found the bodies of Mary Simons and Brian Thomas. Both were in their 70s. Both had been shot to death. Why he killed them is unknown. He knew them, but they weren't involved in the divorce case, and it's, it's never really been explained. They wouldn't be discovered for another day, and he had no reason to kill them. The only real link was that Dwight and Brian occasionally played tennis together. A few hours later, the police began tailing him, and they saw him dump a handgun in a dumpster, along with a black hat. The police would eventually tail him to Scottsdale Extended Stay on 10660 North 69th Street. Early on Monday, the 4th of June, police surrounded the hotel and began to get guests out of there. They tried to do, you know, this quietly without alerting Dwight, but not, unfortunately, quietly enough. As Dwight, he must have heard something, he got out of bed, he poked his little head out the window and saw his hotel absolutely surrounded by police. At this point, Dwight um, shat his own pants, and then he was like, oh, sh like a light bulb, mo light bulb moment, you know, in his head. He realized, oh shit, I actually wrote down five names on that envelope, not four. He had another look at it. Uh-huh, the last name was his own. And you know, so, hey, four to five, you gotta finish what you started. After popping off a few shots at the police, he popped one off at himself. He didn't leave a note or anything. All he left behind was a hotel room filled with crazy person, pure shite. The police found his body inside, along with disguises, the white mask from his videos, guns, knives, and ammo. They also found his laptop, and the laptop had two bullets in it, like he had shot it. Now, I I'm not sure exactly, this is a bit of an unsolved mystery if you ask me, because I'm not sure how he thought the internet works, but um, shooting your computer does not, amazingly enough, erase your search history. Ah, just finished watching some porn, where's the shotgun? In his search history, they found the names and addresses of everyone he had been looking for. When he died, he was wearing a t-shirt with the Punisher logo on it, along with a hat, and he had comic books and DVDs of the Punisher too. He was a big fan. I guess he saw himself much like Frank Castle, avenging those that took away his son. He saw himself as a hero vigilante. They also found the envelope with the names of his intended victims. 
He only actually got one of them, Stephen Pitt, along with five others who had nothing to do with anything. Why Dwight did what he did is still a mystery. He had been living in that hotel for years, if you can believe that, since he moved out of his house he had shared with Connie. So he was likely just just stewing, going more and more batshit with each passing day, until he just had enough. Killing himself was probably always the likely plan. The fact that he killed the two older victims, it's still strange. It's understood Dwight asked one of them, either Mary or Brian, for money shortly before he began his rampage, even though he was getting six grand a month from Connie. They likely refused, and maybe he killed them out of revenge, though he didn't steal anything from their fancy house in Fountain Hills. It is very likely, though, if he hadn't, you know, been tracked down after his big weekend out, he would have crossed off all the names on his list, so he would have gone back for those he missed, and eventually, probably, his wife's. Thankfully, though, cheers Dwight, he crossed off his own name before he could. Thank you so much for listening, uh, my friends, folks out there. I, I really appreciate you taking the time being here with me, listening to this old story. Um, it's a really, really wacky one. But, uh, you know, here, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review. Um, leave me some stars, five stars, please. I beg, I beg, I beg. And, you know, if you want to listen to some more of that chapter podcast, you can. Or if you've listened to them all, why don't you go and YouTube the That Chapter YouTube channel where you can see me telling these two stories, in fact. But, you know, with the videos and the visuals and the audios and all the bits of evidence I could find. You also get to see my very ugly mug, too. So look forward to that. The next podcast episode will be out in a couple of days. So I start counting down the time now. But until then, please take care of each other. Take care of yourselves because you know what you know. And that is... I love you. Mike out.